Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our second podcast having to do with uh, Chapter 6. Uh, we're talking again with that Schedule C, but this topic will impact uh, Schedule E when we talk about rentals later on as well. So the idea is we're going to calculate depreciation. So in the first podcast, we talked about expenses that are ordinary, meaning they happen regularly. When we talk about buying an asset that by definition is going to last more than a year, then it is not a ordinary expense. But to be able to um, offset the cost against the income you make for the, for the business, the tax law allows for you to depreciate these assets, which means you're going to use them up over time and take a, an expense uh, over the years that you use them, okay? So this is probably the most uh, difficult topic, could be one of the most di difficult topics. It seems it gives students the most trouble uh, with depreciation because there's so many things and pieces that go into it. Um, and the Congress keeps changing uh, the rules with regard to depreciation over the years. Um, so first of all, if we're going to calculate depreciation, we need to know what the basis is. What do we have invested in that asset? Typically, that's the cost, but there are other things that will come into that basis. So we'll, we need to know what that is. We need to know how long it's going to last, if you will, um, depreciation periods. The tax law does pretty good by narrowing it down. In, in regular accounting, we, we say, okay, you can come up with whatever time period that, that is most like, likely to be used, okay, so useful life. In the tax law, to try to simplify things, we basically put things into asset classes and say everything in this asset class is going to last five years, and everything in this asset class is going to last seven years, uh, and and that's just to make it um, easier to calculate. But it's something you have to remember, right? Um, the appreciation convention. What do we do with a asset we buy partway through the year? Do we get to take a whole year depreciation on that uh, or, or not? And the answer is no, we don't. Uh, and the same in the year that we sell it, we don't get to take a whole year depreciation. We have to use one of these conventions that um, basically says uh, we're going to assume uh, we don't want to calculate number of days of the year and calculate depreciation for the days. So we come up with some of these simplifications, half year, which is going to be used most of the time, mid-quarter, and mid-month, which is going to apply to all of our uh, real estate type assets. And then there is a method. Remember, in, in regular accounting, we learned that there are different ways to calculate the, the, the depreciation. Well, we have a double declining balance or straight line, 150% uh, or 200 double declining balance, 150% declining balance that are used. And we have to remember which one of those is. Fortunately, and in your appendix to your chapter, they give um, tables that show, and so you don't even have to actually do calculations. Uh, using the formulas for depreciation, you can go to the tables and use them by multiplying the cost of the asset times the percentage it says in the table for whatever year it is and whatever class life. Okay, so if you know those things, you can calculate depreciation without even remembering what the formula is for double declining balance or straight line or anything like that. Okay, this gets reported on Schedule C and, as we mentioned, Schedule E for depreciation. So, what about basis? We talked about cost, usually cost, anything that goes into the cost to get ready to use. So, cost plus sales tax, all that kind of stuff is part of the cost of the asset purchase. 
But what if you didn't buy it? What if you convert something, like many people do when they start a business, from personal use to business use? What is the basis in the asset? You know, you're using an asset now in your business, uh, but you, you had it before as a personal asset. Now you're using it for business, maybe a tool, maybe computer, whatever. What is the basis? What can, can we depreciate it? And the answer is yes. Okay, and again, based on what percentage we use of that, if we use 100% in business now, we can use 100% of the basis, but the basis is going to be the lesser of the fair value or the cost. So what you paid for it when you bought it as a personal asset, okay, or the fair market value when you convert it into a business asset, whichever is the lowest. Okay, the least is going to get you the least amount of depreciation. Okay, so when you convert it, you're going to have to figure that out. Of course, a computer, if you bought it for $2,000 a year ago, is not worth that, right? Because that has gone down. So when you convert it into a personal asset, I mean, into a business asset, you're going to depreciate it based on a basis that's going to be substantially less than your cost. You're going to have to estimate that value at the time you you converted it to business use all right uh, non non-taxable exchange uh, when and we're gonna learn about some of these later on but basically it's going to be the cost but less any deferred gain okay and then if you got an asset inherited it from you know someone passed away your grandma grandparents or something and you use it in a business you want to appreciate it yes you could appreciate it, but your basis is the fair value of that asset at the date of death. Okay, it doesn't matter what they paid for it, doesn't matter the cost, does not matter how old it is, what the fair value is at the date of death would be your basis to calculate depreciation. Okay. Now, remember we said that we try to simplify things by figuring out what the useful life is. We everything basically in uh, that we're going to use in our business fits basically most almost everything's going to fit in these five categories okay three years which means we're going to depreciate it for three years five years where auto trucks computers and off a lot of anything you use in the office for instance any of your office uh, equipment you know, copiers um, under three years is also uh, diesel um, over the road trucks seven years is for furniture fixtures and equipment that like machinery uh, not like office equipment uh, but machinery those things all fit into seven years okay so awful lot of things are going to fit in those things there are other depreciation periods there's 10 there's 15 years but they have they just aren't as applicable so we kind of emphasize these but then if you get into real estate okay buildings then really you only have two um, periods either it is a residential real estate meaning you rent it to people who live there or non-residential to businesses nobody lives there okay and you see the difference in the year how, how long that they are supposed to last Remember, though, any real estate land is not part of the depreciation, not part of the calculation. So you have to separate out the land and then calculate depreciation when you're talking about a built, any kind of building. So those are where that and, and you'll you'll see that that is how the, the tables are organized in your textbook um, as to calculate the depreciation is based on these. Uh, various um, asset class lives uh, columns. All right, remember we mentioned the depreciation convention half year. Um, just half of the uh, depreciation would be if you had it for the whole year. We just assume that all assets were bought halfway through the year, okay? And in the same in the year that we got rid of it, we don't have to go back, calculate up days or anything like that. However, and that's what we can do for almost everything. However, if you buy 
too much of your assets, 40% or more of your uh, personal property. This is non real estate assets in the last quarter of the year. So if you're a calendar year taxpayer, you buy it all in October, November, December, because you know that these assets can depreciate it for a whole, half a year, even though you didn't buy them until the, towards the end of the year. You, you go ahead and wait till the end of the year. You could trigger uh, that if you go over 40% of the total assets you bought, not including real estate, then you have to use the mid-quarter convention and every asset is then depreciated as if it was bought in the middle of the quarter. So the fourth quarter is October, November, December. So mid-quarter treats any asset bought in that quarter as if it was bought on November 15th. Mid-month convention applies to all real estate both residential and non-residential, they all use mid-month convention no matter how many other assets you bought, okay? So the half year doesn't apply to real estate, mid-quarter doesn't apply to real estate, all real estate has a mid-month convention, which is very sp specific, meaning any asset bought in the, during the month is treated as if it was bought halfway through the month. So every um, real estate asset you buy in March is depreciated starting on March 15th. It doesn't matter if you bought it on the 2nd, doesn't matter if you bought it on the 30th, you treat it as if it was bought on the 15th and you would depreciate it for half a year in March and then April through the end of the year, okay? Uh, and you calculate how much depreciation per month and then apply that half a month in the month you bought it and then the rest of the year. And then, of course, the same thing applies when you sell it. All right, you can use double climbing balance, 150 straight climbing balance, straight line. If you look at the tables, if you just use the maker's tables provided, you don't even have to worry about these formulas, okay? So that is the key. So don't worry too much about it. The only thing, time you have to really uh, fiddle with this is knowing these if you have a part of a year for instance a business goes out of business or a partner gets out of a business part way through the year and you have to figure out part of a year then you might need your formulas otherwise the makers tables will take care of almost every one of your situations certainly what we need to know for our uh, homework and such will be taken care of in the tables now that's regular depreciation okay so that means that you're going to depreciate an asset over a period of time using those all those piece those principles, uh, and and after the end of the useful three, five, or seven years, you will have deducted all of the cost of that asset against your the revenues of your business. But it's going to take several years. Okay, so Congress has given us multiple ways where you can depreciate a l whole bunch all at once, okay? With the idea that this will help businesses want to buy more assets because as soon as they buy the asset, instead of having to wait seven years for deductions, they can take the whole amount as deductions in one year or two years maybe or something like that, a, a, an accelerated way. Warning though, after that, if you do all the deduction in year one, there's no deduction left in year two and all the income, you'll have all the income, but no deduction. Okay, that's just, that's the nature of it. Okay, so the first rule is under section 179, referring to the uh, our Internal Revenue Code section 179, where the rules are this, okay, you can, okay, buy up to one million and eighty thousand dollars worth of assets non real estate assets that qualify and of course you have to buy it. you can't inherit it you can't exchange for it you have to buy it or uh, it can be new you can be used but you have to actually buy it uh, you don't have to you, you don't have to pay for it in cash you can borrow money to buy it but you have to buy it and then you can deduct it all at once as long as you didn't buy more than a million and eighty thousand, which is a lot of assets, okay. But 
it cannot exceed how much income you have for that business after all the other expenses. So you can't create a loss using Section 179. Okay, so first of all, the assets have to qualify for Section 179, which means not real estate. Real estate never qualifies as Section 179. Okay, um, standalone real estate. There are some improvements you can add to your buildings and such that will qualify, but not uh, standalone buildings. Everything, other things, for the most part, uh, is Section 179 eligible. Okay, but this does phase out if you buy $2.8 million worth of assets. So this is really not applicable to very large businesses, but most small businesses this could work. Okay, well if you can do this, why would you take regular depreciation if you can choose this? And the answer is you wouldn't. You would choose to use Section 179, okay, and get the deduction faster. Now, they also, they one-upped it even better, okay? But this is going to go away, okay? This, is, this, is, this deduction is going to go away in 2023. But for 2022, which is what we're learning about, you get 100% bonus depreciation on all assets that have a life less than 20 years. So all that three, five, seven-year property, okay, apply, this applies to doesn't apply to real estate again. No buildings, okay? Um, as long as it has useful life less than 20 years, then you can take 100% bonus. This is even better than Section 179. You can depreciate the whole amount that you paid for it. So if you buy, buy an asset for $10,000, instead of waiting seven years to deduct one-seventh of it each year, you deduct all 10,000 because it's 100% bonus, giving you every incentive in theory to buy more assets and hire more workers as uh, Congress likes you to do, okay? Um, <coughs> but remember, take that deduction this year. It's not there next year. This is even better in Section 179 because you can't have a loss, okay? It doesn't have, it's not limited to the amount of income you have from the business. So you can create a loss, Okay, um, it works for used equipment, new equipment. All right, doesn't doesn't matter uh, on that regard. There is no phase out. So if you buy zillions of equipment, you still can use 100%. Okay, there's no limit. Okay, um, other than as we'll see in a little bit, some luxury auto limits. Okay, that's about the only thing that's limited under this uh, this provision. So it's a, quite a bonus, and it means that if you took the bonus, okay, 100% bonus, then there's nothing to depreciate on the asset. Now, on any of these, if you take part of it as a bonus, okay, then you can still depreciate the regular. So in 2023, 2024 actually when this will start to disappear it will go down to 80 percent and if at that point when you take an 80 percent bonus then the other 20 percent you would apply the regular tax rule the regular depreciation rules we had 50 percent bonus back before they made it 100 percent so there's still assets uh, for for businesses that took 50% bonus when that was all it was allowed and then are depreciating it over year the other 50%. Okay? So you always take these the best things first and then it's always regular depreciation for anything left. So, listed property, okay? The most common thing of listed property and listed properties you'll see on the the form actually have to be listed separately. Anything that's not listed property gets summarized on when you report it on the 4562 form. It just gets summarized, everything you bought for the year, one line, okay, and you can't see the detail on the form. But if it's listed, it's because the IRS believes these are things that you could very easily be using for personal use, okay? 
autos, boats are perfect examples. You used to have uh, cell phones that they just finally said that that's so, so ubiquitous that n no, we're not going to play games with that. Everybody has a, a cell phone. Okay, um, it's just autos and boats pre pretty much now. Um, but there's other things that could come up, come around in in this category. These have to be listed individually. All right, and we have some limitations. First of all, you can't use Section 179 if listed property is used in less than 50%. Remember, you can separate uh, expenses. If I use supplies 40% for my business, 60% personal, I can still deduct that 40%. But Section 179 is not allowed if you don't use the asset more than 50% for business. So if you use a 4060, you can't do section 179. You'd have to just do regular depreciation. Okay. Straight line depreciation is then required for listed property if you use less than 50%. So not only do you have to you know, use regular depreciation, you have to, you know, you have to then apply straight line depreciation instead of the maker's tables. Uh, and that's another time when you will have to do some formula calculations you won't be able to use the tables okay so amongst the listed properties are luxury automobiles now all autos trucks and things like that except for like semis and stuff are technically listed property but luxury automobiles have an extra situation and these are those that have have gross vehicle weight of 6,000 pounds or less. So most of your passenger vehicles, large trucks are going to be higher than that, okay? Large SUVs are going to be higher than that. Le smaller SUVs uh, are going to be under the 6,000. This is the limit on your depreciation no matter what way you take depreciation, whether you take Section 179, whether you do bonus, or whether you do regular. The total depreciation maximum you can take for something you buy in 2022 is 19200 I don't care how much it costs. It can cost $250,000 as a Lamborghini. Okay, the most depreciation you can take for one year one is 19200 for year two, eighteen thousand. For year three, ten thousand eight hundred. For four year, fourth year, six fourth, six thousand four hundred sixty. And then you would take that six thousand four hundred sixty every year for the next twenty years, if it was a Lamborghini, to for, to depreciate it. So you can't. You know, there's not an incentive to buy very expensive automobiles because the depreciation is limited no matter what you spent, okay? If you don't take the 100% bonus for whatever reason, which it's hard to imagine what that might be, okay? Then you only have 11.2 the first year, okay? Now, technically in the law, SUVs greater than 6,000 pounds, but under 13,000 pounds, okay? Is limit, section 179 is limited to 27,000, but the 100% bonus makes that not matter because you can still take a 100% bonus depreciation on those big SUVs. Now, when the 100% starts to go away in a couple of years, then we'll start having this be a bigger issue. But for 2022, um, any SUV over six, as long as you have gross vehicle weight of over 6,000 pounds, okay, you can basically depreciate the whole thing as bonus depreciation in year one. Now, what if you lease vehicles? Sometimes that gets popular, especially with your high-end vehicles. Okay. Um, does that mean you can get more of a deduction for a leased vehicle? And the answer is maybe. But the IRS isn't dumb. They realize that people are going to do that. So they have created, or the tax law has created, at the request of the IRS, okay, this idea of lease inclusion amount. And that basically means that if for expensive vehicles, and the, mo the more expensive it is, the more this lease inclusion amount is going to be an issue, okay? It means that if you pay a $1,000 lease payment, some part of it is not going to be deductible. And 
it's kind of an involved process there's a whole bunch of tables figuring out what it is okay but basically the idea is to limit how much of a de deduction you get for leasing a very expensive vehicles and remember you still have to apply the percentage so if you figure out that your you know, say your lease payment is a thousand dollars and your lease inclusion amount is a hundred so only nine hundred dollars deductible but then you only use that uh, that vehicle 80% business then you take that nine thousand and multiply it by eighty percent to get your final deduction okay so that is our discussion of depreciation there's some additional examples in another uh, video showing kind of how some of these work but uh, if you need those so part three we'll deal with the rest of kind of the specific rules with some other deductions that you could take on schedule C